Hi, my name is Laura Lee, and this is It's Not About Food. So it's not about food, and it's not about weight. What is it about? Everything else. Because it's never ever about food, or weight, never ever, not even, one time, not ever, ever, ever. Hi, this is Laura Lee Rourke, and I'm one of the founders of Beyond Hunger and also one of the co-creators of the Body Love Cards. My business partner and I, Carol Normandy, created this organization called Beyond Hunger about 32 years ago at this point. It's amazing to me. And we wrote a few books. One of them is called It's Not About Food, and one of them is called Over It. So my guest today is somebody who helped us with both of those books very, very much. But I'll introduce her in a few minutes. We're going to talk about truth and the body love card truth. On the front of it is a mountaintop and sitting in a lotus position is the goddess who is on the very tippy top of the mountain and she's next to her dear power animal and just sort of looking at the top of the world, if you will, and knowing the truth, knowing the truth and being able to see everything. So the description of the card is, truth is our own internal wisdom that defines who we are. Finding our own truth means figuring out the difference between what we've been told we should be versus who we really are. Oftentimes in the past, our true feelings, passions, opinions, and experiences were ignored, rejected, or just not encouraged. When we can relearn to identify what our own truth is, we are able to put into action what our heart and soul desires. And I find that, for me, with eating disorders, it's very hard to figure out exactly what does my body say that it wants because we've been told what we should and should not eat by whatever diet we've been on or whatever eating disorder part of our recovery we've been on. And the society that we live in tells us that our body should look a certain way and be a certain way and forever young, forever 21. That's what eating disorders tell us for sure. And then that we should be, that society tells us who we should be. We should be rich and maybe famous and have new stuff all the time and buy more stuff all the time. And it's very hard to then go, wait, wait, what is my internal wisdom telling me? What is the truth of me right in this moment? That's really the recovery is to go within and find out what we're really doing here and what we're meant to do and who are we. And when we can figure that out, we really see how much we like ourselves. But that does take a while. My uh, guest today is Patty Brightman, somebody I feel that just completely embodies this whole idea of truth. And she's been on a mission to find it herself, I think, in this lifetime. So I'm going to turn it over. She's going to talk about who she is and what she's been doing and what up with her. And then we'll have a talk about truth. Thank you, Laura Lee. I'm honored that you asked me to come talk about truth because there is only one truth that I know that everybody shares, regardless of how we feel about our bodies, regardless of what life experiences we have. We all share the truth of impermanence. None of us will be here 150 years from now to the best of my knowledge. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) And in some ways, that's a blessing. But what's also true is that our feelings won't be here 24 hours from now. They'll change. Right. And even 24 seconds from now. Exactly. But we, as a culture and as a society, just because of the habits of this life, we tend to think whatever we're feeling now, we'll be feeling forever. And we tend to think whatever we're experiencing now, we should and will experience forever. That's right. So the only truth we can all share is that everything changes. And it's my Buddhist studies and my Buddhist practice that brings me to recognize and to try to live the reality of that, not just as a concept, but to recognize by feeling what I feel and watching it and noticing it, it always changes. Right. When I'm having a good cry and it feels like it'll last forever, 
20 minutes later, sometimes it feels like a storm passed through. Exactly. And my sinuses are clear, my head is clear, and whatever <laughs> taught, whatever led me to cry is no longer prominent. What's prominent in the next moment is something entirely different. Right. Which isn't to say I won't cry again in the future. But noticing even in heartbreak, even in loss, even in disappointment, the feelings, if you watch them carefully, aren't stagnant. They change. Right. Exactly. They come and they go. And we have to realize that in order to befriend ourselves. Well, I think, again, this comes from, like you're talking about, the culture that we live in. I was raised to be, if somebody said, how are you doing? The answer was, I'm fine. How are you? Just to throw it back at them right away so I didn't have to talk anymore about me, how I am. And it was only fine. It was fine. I'm fine. I'm fine. Always fine. And not really fine at all, but you could never say that. Most people don't want to hear that answer, though. I'm fine is a convention we use to keep the conversation going. An answer I recently learned that I like a lot when someone says, how are you, is the best that I can be. Because if you could be better, you would be better. And in every moment, we are the best that we can be. But the next moment, maybe we can do something differently and be a little different. Yeah. But by saying the best that I can be reminds me that in every moment, I am the best that I can be right now and that that will change also. Yes, exactly. And I love one thing that I've heard you say many times in over the years when we've talked about heavy duty stuff, if we've gotten into that, everybody dies. Well, I wrote a book called Even Vegans Die because right. I've been on a vegan journey for 30 years. And the realization that nothing will save us from mortality, even right. the perfect diet, the perfect body, the perfect exercising, the myth right. of getting it right is really just a myth. Right. Because no matter how right you get it, we're not here forever. We're not young forever. We're not able-bodied forever. We're not healthy forever. And it's almost a miracle that we are healthy and able-bodied as long as we are. Right. We should be saying, oh, of course, when something happens to us that throws us off, not why me, but of course this is going to happen. That's the nature of being human. Right. In some countries practice Buddhism, three times a day they remind themselves, I am of the nature to age, I am of the nature to have ill health, and I am of the nature to die. And there's an app I have on my phone called We Croak. <laughs> That comes about six or seven times a day at random times. It comes to remind up you you're going to die. To remind you you're going to die, and it's not nice. all glo it's not all gloom and doom though. They had Betty White. They have quotes from different people, and some are serious and some are funny, Aww. but they're all of the theme of impermanence. Right. Exactly. My favorite one was from Betty White. She was quoted as saying, "My friends tell me I should get on Facebook to connect with old friends, and I tell them at my stage of the game to connect with old friends, I need to get on a Ouija board." <laughs> So some of the quotes are fun and so right, they're, they're right. all reminding us that we're not going to be here forever. And in a way, that reminder makes me, encourages me to be kind to people. And to live more in the moment. To live more in the moment and to be kind to myself. Yeah. Because right. I'm the only friend I have. This is the only body I'll ever have. That's right. And I want to be a good friend to myself. So what would you tell a friend who is in pain? You wouldn't say, oh, get over it or right. oh, just go eat something. Right. <laughs> Well, or, oh, if well you, you would if you were in my family. <laughs> <laughs> but learning to be a good friend to yourself and to others is easier when you realize that, first of all, we're all in this together. Nobody escapes the human condition. And second of all, nobody survives the human condition more than the lifespan. That's right. I mean, nobody gets out of here alive, as we see over and over again. But we don't recognize that in this culture. I know. We don't want to talk about that. We don't want to talk that everybody gets sick. Everybody dies. Everybody gets everything all the time. I mean, it's just the way it is. And I recently had a really good friend of mine die. And I've had to tell myself that many times in the last couple of weeks that, well, it was part of her path to die. Just because I'm upset about it doesn't mean that it wasn't going to happen. I have to just accept that this is what happens. To it all happens of us. to all of us. And either we leave right. or someone we love leaves, but right. we don't get out alive. But that's not to say we can't honor the memory. It's not to say we can't cherish the memory. It's not to say we can't mourn. It's just to say that accepting as natural that everything ends yep. makes it easier to be present for friends and ourselves while we're here. Right. It's like George Harrison. You were talking about the Beatles a minute ago. His song, All Things Must Pass, that he wrote after his mother died and he got a lot of pushback from that. Like, you're one of the Beatles. That's like such a downer song. And he's like, no, it's really actually a beautiful song. 
I'm not familiar with that song. Oh, you'll have to listen I'll to it. I'll have to listen, but All I love the song. Must pass. Let it be is another perfect example, though. I it's know. just the way it is. It is what it is. Which isn't to say we can't change and grow and make healthy changes in our life. It just means that no matter how we change and how we grow and who we become, we still have to go to bed and wake up with ourselves while we're still here. That's right. And being kind to ourselves is the way to start being kind to others and being in the world comfortably. Right. And when we have an eating disorder or some sort of illness or something that really could very easily get away from us and kill us way sooner than we think that we should be killed, you know, or whatever. I feel like when we have something like that, we have to acknowledge it in order to heal it if you're able to heal from it. But if I hadn't acknowledged that I had an eating disorder and acknowledged that it may kill me, then I wouldn't have gotten well. I needed to have that big, heavy-duty, come-to-Jesus moment with myself of like, wait, what you're doing will kill you soon. Yeah. If you don't eat and you don't have a body, you don't get to be here. Right. Most of us at some point in our lives will get that scary diagnosis, whether it's through an eating disorder or something else. And if we practice in advance of getting it, it makes it a little less scary when we get it to know that, oh, yes, so that's what's going to get me or so that's what's coming to get me. It doesn't mean that's what we'll die of, but sometimes we get a diagnosis that predicts most likely that might be what gets you. And if we can be friends with ourselves, we'll be a comfort to ourselves instead of an hysterical, out-of-control fear monger. When Mm -hmm. we get the news of like, oh, you have this, instead of saying, okay, what's the next step? We say, oh, my God, why me? And now I'm going to die. Yeah. Well, we're all going to die. And the sooner we face that, the more equanimity we can bring to that diagnosis and the more wise our choices can be in the face of the diagnosis. It's so true. And I love what you just said about if we don't freak ourselves out even more than we're already freaked out. Somebody else on one of the podcasts talked about the idea that her body is her companion. And, you know, if your companion said, oh, I have this disorder and it's really scary for me, you wouldn't start just screaming at him, what the hell's wrong with you? Why do you have that? Don't have that. Don't get rid of that thing, whatever it is. You would go, how can I support you? Exactly. Our body is our lifelong companion from the first breath to the last. It's the only companion we have for the whole road show. That's it. That's we're the only ones that are really going to be there for the whole thing. Nuts to soup or whatever that's. Soup to nuts. Soup to nuts, right. (laughs) (laughs) You can say nuts to soup. I don't like soup, nuts to soup, but I think it's soup to nuts, but who knows. No, I think it is soup to nuts. Now we're going on in this kind of conversation. Anyway, so tell me a little bit. So you've been practicing Buddhism for a really long time. And also, you've been a vegetarian, a vegan for a very long time, which, of course, is how another way that I knew you. And so how do you sort of live in the culture that we live in that is not built on truth? Our history that we're taught is like, whatever, it's not really the truth. (laughs) It's hard. It's a lesson every day. And bearing witness to the ugliness of what our society tries to sweep under the rug, bearing witness to what really happens to animals on factory farms, bearing witness to what happens to fish and industrial fishing operations, bearing witness to the cruelty in animal labs. Yes, helps me establish a sense of reality that the rest of society is trying to keep a veil over. Yeah, and so how do you become that terror away of the veil? I don't see my role as tearing it away for other people. Everyone has to do that for themselves to the best of their ability in the moment. Uh huh. For myself, it's almost like a grotesque addiction in that I can't look away. It's like I want to see what's happening. Don't, Don't hide it from me. Don't call it a hamburger, it's cow's flesh. Don't (laughs) call it a frankfurter, it's pig's flesh and a million chemicals. Right. So I like to tell the truth, but I don't say that everyone has to see the truth the way I see the truth. In your own time, in your own way, it's a good idea to start peeling away the layers of denial. That's right. Yeah. But we can make it worse by insisting that we see it all at once and do something about it right away. We have to, again, be kind to ourselves and do what we can without hurting ourselves. Yeah, there's a great saying, we can only go as fast as the slowest part of us can go. Well, that's true. So (laughs) that reminds me of the bumper sticker I saw that says, I only drive as fast as my guardian angel can keep up. (laughs) Yeah, go ahead. Right. There's something in Buddhism I'd like to share. You talked about not freaking out when you get the diagnosis. There's a story of the two arrows and the Buddha uses this analogy 
Life is going to have its painful moments. That's inescapable. People we love are going to die. We're going to get sick. Things are going to happen that we prefer not to happen. And that's like being shot with an arrow. But we shoot ourselves with subsequent arrows by telling stories about it and screaming about it and tearing our hair out about it and making it all about us instead of seeing the impersonal nature of it and that that's what life entails. That's just something that happens in life. So he, I think he used the words, it's translated as arrow or dart. But sometimes we hit ourselves with the second dart or the second arrow and we make a bad situation worse by not facing it and sitting down with it and befriending it and saying, okay, you're here now. What can we do to make your stay Yes. As short as possible, but not kick you out screaming and denying your existence. Exactly. So we have exactly. to learn to acknowledge the first arrow and not hurt ourselves with subsequent arrows. Mm -hmm. I love that analogy. I love that too. And I've been a an arrow thrower myself for many, <laughs> many times. We all are. Our reaction is, why me? Why now? Oh, no, this can't be happening. Right. Instead of, oh, I yes. I don't want this to be the way that it is. Well, we often don't want things to be the right. way they are, but our suffering is right. compounded by pushing it away or clinging to it. By identifying as a victim or by pushing it away in denial, we That's suffer right. more than just sitting with it and saying, okay, you're here now. What's next? Right. Exactly. It's like in my recovery from alcohol, somebody said, well, acceptance is the key to all recovery. And it's sort of like, I don't want to accept that I can never have another glass of wine. They said, well, you don't know that you can never have one. You just can't have one right this minute because it doesn't work well for you. Studies have shown that it doesn't work well for I you. I love that expression. And how did that work out? Yes. <laughs> the first time I heard that, it made me laugh. Right. But it's it's relevant all the time. It is. And it's so much easier to go, well, I can accept that right this minute. I'm not sure how I'm going to feel in a year, but right now I can do it. You don't know that you'll be here in a year. That's, That's what I right. love about impermanence. Right. This minute is all you have. So if you can accept it now, everything's okay. Sometimes when I have a symptom of some kind, I'll tell myself, are you okay in this moment? And I'll say, yes, I'm okay in this moment. So why am I worried that the symptom is going to blow up and become something worse? Right. Why can't I just enjoy this moment? If I'm here five years from now, this will be the good old days. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> if it does progress, I'll look back at today and say, boy, you didn't know how good you had it. You know, that's so true because I have so many clients and myself included in this and that we would hate our bodies, hate them so much, just loathe them. And then five years later, you look at a picture of yourself and you go, what was wrong with me? I was so cute. Why was I so upset about myself? But now I look terrible. Well, in five years, you're going to go, what was wrong with me? I actually looked fine. Why was I so upset? Even if you don't look cute, it's not about what you look like because the good looking people and the horrible looking people are all going to be dead in 100 years. <laughs> Anne, Anne Lamott had this quote in one of her books that her father took her aside and said, look around you, everyone you see 100 years from now, all new people. They're all gone. They're all gone, These all people. new people. And right. I thought, that's brilliant. It is brilliant. It doesn't matter if you're honest or not. It doesn't matter if you're pretty or not. It doesn't matter if you're successful or not. We're all equal in our impermanence. That's right. That's right. It's kind of daunting, isn't it? I it's mean, daunting, it's but hard for us to get our little minds computer around. minds around that. But I like, find wait. it helpful. There are two ways to look at people who find you find challenging, relationships that are difficult. One way is to imagine them as a baby mm -hmm. before they had a strong personality form, just that they were an infant too once. And then also imagine them 150 years from now when they're ashes and you're ashes. Mm -hmm. Both ways help you realize this isn't forever. Yeah. So even when you disagree vehemently, which I do with a lot of people in the news and in my life, I find a way to wish them peace of mind, wish them well-being. There's a line in Fiddler on the Roof that I love where... Um, Someone asked the rabbi if there's a blessing for the czar in Russia. And he says, of course, there's a blessing for the czar. And everyone looks surprised. And he says, may the good Lord bless and keep the czar. And the whole town goes, ah, oh! he says, far away from us. <laughs> and everybody <laughs> breathes out. Right. So I can wish even my enemies, even the people I disagree with vehemently, I wish them well. I wish them distance from me, but I wish them well. <laughs> yeah, well... We've just had our 
Pelosi say to tell everybody that she prays for the president and people were shocked and the president said, I don't think she prays for me, but I actually believe her that she probably does pray for him all the time and we should all really pray for him. I send him wishes of well-being. I wish him a calm, clear mind and a peaceful, loving heart. May you, I say, I talk to him. May you have a calm, clear mind and a peaceful, loving heart. Well, that's sort of like the meta meditation. May all beings be free of suffering. May we all find peace. That's such a beautiful prayer to send out. It helps me too. I mean, prayer isn't only about the person you're praying for. It's a way to calm yourself. Exactly. Exactly. To let that go. I just mentioned it in the opening, but Patty was so great helping us get the book, It's Not About Food, out into the world and really helped us a lot. I want to say just how much I appreciate her, that she held our vision for us while we wrote it, and we got it out, and it was great, great, great. And I'm just wondering about holding the vision for other people, the vision of truth. How is that for you when you know that that's what you need to do? Like somebody's going to be floundering around, like just coming up with the truth of we all die. Or or even vegans die. And the reason why you wrote that book is because people said, well, I'm now I'm sick and I can't be sick. I'm vegan. I never smoked any cigarettes. I never did anything terrible. Why am I sick? And you like, well, everybody gets sick. But we think in this culture that to get sick and to die, we've done something wrong. But it is what happens. We're actually doing something right then. We're fulfilling our destiny. Absolutely, we are. <laughs> I don't know about holding other people's truths. I think everyone has to hold their own truth. Mm -hmm. But I think living with integrity and doing the best you can in every moment is an example to other people. So all I can do is be who I am and make the choices I make. And if other people like them and want to emulate me, fine. And if they don't, that's their path. Well, you were very good the first time I met you. And I told you that I met you at a how to write a How to get published somehow. How to get published workshop. And so I told you, well, what should I do? I'm I'm thinking about writing this book. And you said, well, don't quit your day job. (laughs) (laughs) And I'm glad you didn't because you've been helping me in your day job for decades. (laughs) But for me, that was a truth that I totally needed to hear right then. Because there's a fantasy of that. I'll be the next Stephen King or the next, I don't know who... Oprah, whoever it is that's writing thousands of books all the time, or who is that one that writes a new book every week? Tom Hartman. <laughs> right. So many different Joyce books. Joyce Carol Oates writes yes, a new book exactly. every time you breathe. But that wasn't my path, you know. Was <laughs> well, accepting reality is a big challenge for all of us. And one of the realities you had a hard time accepting was when I retired. You kept begging me to go back to work. You kept saying, that I'm not accepting that. You can't retire. Right. Like, okay. Well, I still think that, though. <laughs> 30 years later. No, you're still going to publish. You're still going to edit my next book and then get me a million dollar advance for it. You just don't know that yet. <laughs> And some of us love our fantasies, and that's what I love about you, (laughs) Loralee. We do, we do. So talk about a little bit, if you don't mind, about finding out the difference of what we've been told and what we figure out as we live through our life. Boy, that's a big one. I was in my early 30s when I edited a book called Fit for Life. It was a diet book. Right. And editing that book- Harvey, low fat. Right? No, it wasn't low fat. It was um, what you eat during what time of day. It was about eating only fruit before noon and about not oh, combining yeah. two things at one meal. Mm-hmm. Anyway, that book changed my life, not because of the diet part of it, but because of the message that human beings weren't meant to eat animals. I'll never forget what Harvey Diamond wrote. He said, if you put a baby in a crib with an apple and a rabbit, if that baby eats the rabbit and plays with the apple, I'll buy you a new car. <laughs> <laughs> and he never had to buy anyone a Nobody new car. Nobody got a new car. No, because babies right. are naturally drawn to love animals and pet them and want to play with them. And apples, they see as food. Right. So that book just totally blew my mind. Because right. it never dawned so on true. me. Right. He also talked about how we keep our cars clean and we get them washed and we vacuum them. And we're so careful about the car, but we don't pay any attention to what we're doing to our bodies when we eat. Yeah. If it tastes good and it fits in our mouth, we're just conditioned to eat it. Right. And he pointed out that there are foods that can clean out the system and foods that hurt the system. 
And he made me appreciate that we can make choices that help our bodies. So that book just totally changed my life. Great. And that was the first time I realized the effect of what our parents tell us and feed us. Mm -hmm. And what society tells us and feeds us. Mm -hmm. And what industry, who paid for all the posters of the four food groups that were in the classrooms when we grew up, what they teach us to believe isn't necessarily the truth. So that was my first step of realizing that what I've been told isn't necessarily what's true. Right. And then how did your body feel? I'm a big proponent of we're all intuitive eaters. We've learned how to eat the apple and not the bunny. We didn't even have to learn that. That was just in us. So we all know how to eat. We all need to remember that we know when we're hungry. We know when we're full. We know what our bodies want. Now, we'll argue with that with our brilliant minds that come up with different ways that we should do it. But how do you know that this is what your body is wanting you to eat? Well, like you read something and it I tried it out. Your, I tried it right. out and I felt incredibly energized. Mm -hmm. I felt empowered, first of all, that I was making conscious choices instead of just doing what I was told to do. In fact, when I edited that book, I had been eating a breakfast I hated, but I was told it was good for me. I couldn't stand cottage cheese, and I was eating cottage cheese. To make it palatable, I was putting honey on it. And wow. I don't even like honey, but I was trying to make it palatable because I thought that's a healthy breakfast. Right. Somebody told you. Somebody told me. Right. That my mother has been on a diet for 60 years. <laughs> How's that working out? Exactly. <laughs> She's afraid of bread. She's afraid of potatoes. It's like my sister and I laugh because my mother's afraid of anything she thinks is fattening. Yes. And the word fattening, I keep telling her, is not a real word. It's like nothing is fattening. Oh, no, I can't eat bread. I can't eat potato. Anyway, that's that's a whole other it's show whole about other my show. mother. <laughs> <laughs> but realizing that what I learned from my mother and from society wasn't necessarily serving me. That That's breakfast right. was disgusting. I hated yeah. it and I forced it down because I was told it was important. When I started right. making choices that felt more intuitive and felt more like, oh my God, I'm allowed to have fruit for breakfast. That's great. Mm -hmm. I felt empowered by the choices, but also physically I felt much lighter. I felt more in accord with the way things are supposed to be. But I didn't take the book's word for it. I tried it. Yes. And oh, my goodness, those choices just work for me so well that like I've been eating that way now since it was 1985. How many years ago is that? 95, 05, 15. A whole lot. 34 <laughs> years I've been eating that way. And it's not difficult. It's just a way of like, oh, whole natural foods taste good. Yes. And that's how you found your truth was that that's what worked in your body, which I think our bodies know the truth. Our minds might not, but our bodies do. But our taste buds are intentionally designed to make sure that super sweet foods are palatable and attractive. Even meat is addictive because something that's so dense in its taste, the salt, the mm -hmm. sugar, the oil, mm -hmm. we evolved as people who needed calories. So naturally, exactly. we're attracted to calorie density. Mm -hmm. Now that we can artificially create that in pizza, in ice cream, and anything that's dense calorically, it's addictive food because mm -hmm. we want more oil. We want more fat. We want more salt. So that's a tendency that's hard to overcome. But if we lean toward what's best for ourselves and what feels right, it's not like we can't eat foods that are oily or fatty or salty, but we tend to want them less often because we feel better when we don't eat them. That's we right. have to be in touch with how right. we feel after we eat them. It does taste good to eat an ice cream sundae. But if you had one every day, you'd start not enjoying it so much or feeling so good. Right. And I think that's the part of the intuitive eating is like, I remember watching my grandson who my daughter-in-law put several little pieces of food on his tray mm -hmm. and he would pick what tasted the best to him. And even though maybe couldn't figure out why he didn't eat more of the one watermelon and he ate a grape instead, but he just would pick up something and put it in his mouth and then put it down and pick up something else and eat that one. And it was just watching this beautiful little being who had no idea that there was right or wrong. It just was. And such a pure eater. And I think we're all born like that. And if we just listen to our bodies... And like you're saying, and then feel how that feels. Then eat and then feel how that feels. We forget that last part. Exactly. Yeah. See the results. Right. So 
If there was a young woman out in the world, uh, some young girl sitting on her bed going, boy, I would really like to break out of how my family or my culture or my society, the town I live in, how they all think about food or weight. I would love to be able to do that, but I just don't feel strong enough or I don't even know that that is a possibility. What would you say to her? That's a very good question. I would say, first of all, read the books by Laura Lee Rourke and Carol Normandy, because that's a good start. (laughs) I would also say, do your own research and start asking questions. Ask people what they found helpful to break away from the habits and the conditioning that they were raised with. Yeah. And get support, because community is everything. Yes. Having people understand your quest and maybe find people who've been on a similar quest doesn't matter whether they found it yet, but if they're questing in that direction, it's good to have other people on the path with you. Exactly. So try to find community among other people that made that change. And it doesn't always have to be about food. They may have wanted to leave a religion or a cult or a exactly or a family dynamic that wasn't serving yeah, or them well. Or a town or a job or school. Try whatever. to find other people who've taken that leap. So, Patty, I would like you to just spend just a moment of talking about a couple of different books that I know that you've written. The one, How to Say No, If You Can't Say No, You Can't Say Yes, which I love, and the basis of that book. How to Say No Without Feeling Guilty. Yeah. And Say Yes to What Matters Most to You. Because until we learn how to say no, what isn't working for us, to what isn't working for us, we don't have room to say yes to what might work for us. Right. So I wrote that book with a dear friend of mine from college. And originally, we were calling it How to Work in Your Pajamas, because we were both freelance writers, and we worked at home. (laughs) And we realized that a lot of what we were writing about wasn't just about working in your pajamas. It was about forging your own path. That's right. Figuring out what you really want to do and finding a way to do it. And the only way to clear space for that is to stop saying yes to the things you really don't want to do, but you're doing because society's asking you to do it. Right. Or you're in the habit of doing it. Right. Or you're too scared to do what you really want to do. Right. Right. So learning to say no. And I also wrote that because people used to ask me what I did for a living. And I would say I say no for a living because 99 times out of 100, if somebody came to me with a book they wanted to publish, I had to say no. Right. So I got very good at saying no. And whenever I told and people, no one likes that. No one likes to hear it. But when I told people I say no for a living, so many people said, oh, I wish I could do that. Oh, teach me how to do that. Oh, if only I could do that. Yes. So I wrote the book to share some tips on how you can learn. It's an acquired skill. Anybody can learn by practicing. Right. How to say no. And it really works. Yeah, it does really work. And I've given that book to several people. Thank you. <laughs> And then, of course, got upset when they said no to me. (laughs) Again, your latest one of Even Vegans Die, of how beautiful that book is. And not only the whole concept of it, but also of what we need to do to prepare. We do need to prepare. Well, we don't need to. People die all the time without having prepared. Yeah. But it's very helpful to those who will survive us and to our own peace of mind at the end. Yes. If we take care of some basics and cleaning up our relationships and cleaning up our homes and cleaning up any loose ends and unfinished business, don't wait till you're on your deathbed to start apologizing or thanking or loving people who call forth love and regret and hurt in your life. Deal yeah. with deal with those messes that you made while you're still here and you can. Yeah. Well, I know that for me, going through my mother's death, it taught me how to really prepare a lot further on than just at the very last minute. I have an old friend that said, when I die, I want to have everything that somebody else needs about my life, what insurance to do and where things are by everything's in one manila envelope. That would be a gift to the person who survives you. Right. I was hand it to them. I know. I wrote that book the year after a good friend of mine died and I was the executor of his estate. Yeah. And I realized, like you're saying, there's a lot you can do to make it easier for those who will survive you. And thank goodness he did everything right. And he had he made it easy for me. Even though the death came unexpectedly, everything was in order to take the next step and to be able to grieve because I wasn't spending all my time with logistics. Isn't that the truth? So you're not working Instead of grieving. Right. That you get to just feel the feeling that your friend is no longer here. It's so true. It helped me a lot. My mom was uh, much more organized in death than she was in life. (laughs) 
Well, that's and a gift she left you. She did. She really did. And I'm hoping to be a lot better than that. I try to get almost everything to fit into one manila envelope. Even if it's a whole drawer full, at least it's in one place. Yes, exactly. And nobody is perfect. None of us is going to get it right. No, there's always going to be some mess somebody's going to clean up because life is messy. Life is messy. And we have to learn to be comfortable with the mess or we're going to make ourselves crazy. Right. Well, on that note, that's such an honest and uh, true note. I'm going to have you read the for today. This is from the truth card. Today, I will practice listening to my own internal wisdom. When I start to become fearful, confused, insecure, self-critical, or find myself doing something I don't want to do, I will take a breath and ask myself, what is my truth? Beautiful. That's a really great thing to do. Like several times a day, take a breath. And say, what is my truth? Maybe breathe out. (laughs) I want to add one phrase to that. Yes. What is my truth in this moment? Yes. Because we have to remember the truth may be different an hour from now. In this moment, my truth might be I need a nap. Right. An hour from now, my truth might be I need a glass of water or I need to call a friend or I need to just sit and meditate. But if you add in this moment, it takes the pressure off of having to find your life's truth whenever you're freaking out. And you just have to ask in this moment, what in is this, my truth? In this very moment. And also to stay with ourselves. It's not my truth is you're a big jerk. <laughs> <laughs> it's my truth is I'm having a hard time right now with this. Yeah. Exactly. Thank you so much, Patty, for being here today. Thank really you, appreciate Marley. you doing it. My pleasure. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Thank you for listening. And be sure and follow me on Patreon, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and it's not about food.com. Thanks.